Good morning. It's Friday, May 22nd, 2015, and this is your morning edition on I-24 News. Coming up later today, Islamic State forces tighten their grip on the historic Syrian city of Palmyra. Ireland gets ready for a referendum on gay marriage. And later on the show, an exclusive interview with the former U.S. Senator and Vice Presidential nominee, Joe Lieberman. Good morning, I'm Yael Wisner-Levy, and we begin now in Syria, where Islamic State militants have captured the 2,000-year-old city of Palmyra after a battle with pro-government forces. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, more than 300 people have been killed there since last week, among them more than 50 civilians, some of whom were executed. The UN has urged an end to the fighting to protect civilians and the cherished antiquities there, warning that the destruction of the ancient city would be an enormous loss to humanity. The capture of Palmyra leaves more than half of Syria under IS control and comes days after the group also expanded its control in Iraq. To discuss uh, this issue further, we're now joined in studio by our senior defense correspondent, Amir Oren. Good morning, Amir. Thank you morning, for joining Yael. us. Thank you. Let's take a look now at the following report and we'll break it down from there. A case of shifting momentum. The ancient city of Palmyra in central Syria has become the latest to fall into the hands of the Islamic State terrorist group. After the Iraqi city of Ramadi was captured by the jihadists earlier this week, Palmyra was taken after pro-regime fighters fled and marks the first direct conquest by IS of a city held by President Bashar al-Assad. There are people from the city joining IS. They led the IS militants into the city and helped them. Without their help, the IS militants would not know where to go and which street, which houses are key. Syrian state television admitted the regime was no longer in control of the historic city. The IS militants have tanks, mortars, missiles and heavy machine guns. Their weapons are advanced. They launch the attack from many directions, with each group consisting of a dozen or some 30 people. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, a London-based NGO, the conquest of Palmyra means that IS now controls over 50 percent of Syrian territory. It is important to note, however, that the Assad regime retains control of most of the major cities. The fall of Palmyra may have strategic importance as it could provide IS with a staging ground for a military push westward towards the capital Damascus as well as the city of Homs. Beyond the obvious implications concerning the welfare of those living under the iron fist of the Islamic State, many are also worried about the fate of Palmyra's famous Roman era ruins. The ancient city is a historic landmark recognized by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. The trail of destruction left by IS in both Iraq and Syria has already consumed countless historical artifacts. Uh, we may have uh, different beliefs, uh, we may have uh, different uh, views, but uh, we have to protect uh, such uh, incredible vestiges of, of human history. In the recent past, such pleas have fallen on deaf ears. Many are hoping that the case of Palmyra will be different and that the general momentum in the fight against extremism in the Middle East will shift once again. So, Amir, the fall of Palmyra, without, uh, of course, uh, talking uh, yet about the casualties and, and the number of uh, executed uh, people, civilians mostly there in the city, it also means that ISIS has now 50 percent of Syrian territory and it's nearing Damascus. Right. The percentage itself um, is not of major significance, but um, you have several um, fights here uh, in tandem. You have the tactical fight over uh, land routes, because this is mostly desert country, and there are not too many uh, roads uh, leading um, east to west or north to south. And the key towns, especially the border crossings uh, between Syria and Lebanon uh, in the west and Syria and Iraq uh, in the east. But perhaps even most important is the battle for public opinion the battle of the narratives, mm -hmm. because um, what earlier in the month looked like um, uh, a victory by the anti-ISIS uh, coalition, uh, this time led by uh, U.S. Uh, special forces raiding in uh, Syria, now seems uh, to have shifted. And it has shifted back and forth uh, uh, before. It doesn't mean that uh, the end is near, but it does mean that if uh, the U.S.-led coalition uh, wished to uh, depict uh, that its forces are uh, going to win and that ISIS is on the run, this is not so at all. 
what this also shows uh, beyond uh, the shortcomings and the limitations of the U.S. airstrikes is also the shortcomings and limitations of the Iraqi army, which was uh, bolstered up by the Obama administration, and the shortcomings of the Syrian government, which until now was able to protect its citizens, the citizens it wanted to protect. Let's put it that way. Um, you are correct uh, to bundle them both uh, in the same sentence, Iraq and Syria, because ISIS uh, sees them, of course, as, it, uh, right. its, as its name uh, implies, as part of its, the same caliphate. Um, and indeed, it's the same piece of territory. Uh, colonial powers have decided that uh, a line uh, would, uh, would be drawn on a map uh, somewhere. But it is indeed the same ancient uh, territory. And both governments, uh, for various reasons, uh, Damascus and Baghdad, uh, have a hard time uh, holding uh, onto the territories. But there is another uh, measure of what is happening. Um, earlier, um, when the U.S. was in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. one, one of the orders given to its troops was to be careful not to kill one terrorist and thereby cause 10 of his relatives uh, to be so uh, angry and vengeful that they uh, joined the terrorists. Here, uh, the coalition has managed to kill many thousands of ISIS fighters, perhaps 7,000, but more than 8,000. Um, uh, are estimated to have joined ISIS. Right. So, so the cash flow, if one may talk in, in human terms, is for ISIS because what in the West is seen as abusive or horrible is seen as exciting um, in the Orient. Well, uh, of course, uh, the Arab leaders uh, in the region, in this uh, ISIS region, if we can call it now that, are worried as well. Al Abadi, uh, the Iraqi prime minister, met with uh, Putin yesterday, knowing, knowingly lo not looking uh, west, but looking now uh, to another global leader, Russia, for help, meaning times are getting tough and they're not trusting now the United States. They are not trusting anyone. There are, there are uh, 60 uh, nations in this coalition, and uh, at various times, some of them are taking part in airstrikes in Iraq, in Syria, even in, in Yemen, on another front. Right. But Russia is a crucial player here because they have a stake in Syria's coast, not in Iraq's, in Syria, in Latakia, and Tartus. Now, what would happen if we are reaching the end game for Assad and uh, Russia decides to intervene? What would be that uh, tipping point? What would be well, that the, pivotal moment? The tipping point would only be Damascus itself. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Assad may lose uh, Homs, Aleppo, uh, every other stronghold, as long as he has his own Alawite stronghold um, up in the northwest. Uh, and Damascus, the capital, he is in power. But uh, a minute before he is toppled, Russia and perhaps even Iran. Iran has a presence there by Quds Force right. uh, troops. But they may intervene in force in order to prevent uh, such a collapse. And this is also going to be a bad omen for Hezbollah, because Hezbollah has been taking part in, in this fight, losing hundreds of uh, fighters, and um, even Lebanon is um, at stake in this uh, global game. And quickly, you did speak about public opinion within uh, Syria, but what about public opinion within the Western nations? Obama does have to speak to his people and say, look, we're carrying out these airstrikes. They're obviously not working. The airstrikes are, are not working enough, but... Right. Not uh, working the way he thought it would. Yes, but uh, still he's not going to put boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, the, there is the problem of uh, foreign fighters coming back. And uh, next week uh, in Rome, there is going to be a conference of Western nations uh, trying uh, to brainstorm the idea. Nothing um, important is going to come out of it. Amir Oren, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Yael. On now to our next topic. In Ireland, members of the LGBT community have often faced a stark choice between leading secret lives or emigrating to more liberal lands. And tonight, the Irish public could turn that tradition on its head and vote to legalize same-sex marriage in the world's first national referendum on this matter. We're going to take now a look at the next report about the upcoming referendum in the country, and we'll take it from there. In Dublin, every lamppost is a battleground for Ireland's referendum on same-sex marriage. The No campaign says a change in law would undermine the traditional family. But others believe gay and lesbian couples deserve equality. I'm going to vote yes um, in the referendum just because I believe that um, people should have the right to marry whoever they want to, essentially, and I don't think it really affects anyone else. 
All the main political parties support the change to the constitution, some joining the yes bus as it tours the country. It's a huge shift in a country where homosexuality was only decriminalized in 1993 and abortion is still illegal. The no side says its own supporters are often afraid to speak out for fear of appearing homophobic. I really believe that we need to continue to endorse and support the gender balance that is inherent in our institution of marriage. Dublin's small but thriving gay scene is a world away from the country's historic image as a conservative Catholic nation. The church itself is opposing the change, but its influence has been seriously undermined by a series of child sex scandals. The Catholic Church is not remotely as powerful as it was in previous times. If you consider what's happened to the Catholic Church over the last 30 years, uh, an awful lot of its credibility has been lost, particularly its credibility around issues relating to sexuality. Some of Ireland's biggest names have backed the Yes campaign as they seek to create what they believe will be a more diverse, tolerant republic. We're joined now from London by I-24 News European correspondent Jonathan Saturdati. Jonathan, good morning. Thank you for joining us. The question I uh, hear that probably a, a lot of people around the world are, are questioning themselves this morning, is, is it really fair to put the rights of a minority in the hands of a popular vote? Well, on the contrary, I think mm -hmm. the feeling in Ireland is that in order for this not to be challenged after it has become law, if that is the way it goes, they feel that it will be a much stronger piece of legislation if it has the popular support of a referendum yes vote. And to that end, that's why they're holding this particular vote. And in fact, it's the only country in the world, as far as I'm aware, that is doing it this way, that is going to the people and saying, do you support this change of what it means to be married? Do you support the idea that two people of the same gender, of the same sex, can also get married just as a man and a woman can? And the Yes campaign has been uh, going strong. A lot of celebrities uh, joining in. Let's take a quick look at this next clip. Yes, this clip is uh, Colin Farrell, the Hollywood actor who's known for his macho roles. He's come out, so to speak, in support of the Yes vote as his brother is gay and has married in Canada already. Let's take a look. This is bickering about concepts. This is bickering about, about, about dynamics and about, you know, verbiage and wording, same sex, uh, uh, civil partnership, civil, mar you know, I don't want to say, you know, will you partnership me? I mean, will you partnership me? Will you marry me? It's, it's marriage that, it should be a level playing field for everyone. But Jonathan, there is a no campaign and it's mainly being backed by the Catholic Church, once a huge uh, player on the political scene today. Is it as strong as it used to be? The Catholic Church's role is much weaker in Ireland, particularly after recent decades with some controversies. But it is nonetheless a powerful force, and in more rural areas, and perhaps with some older citizens as well, it's thought that it may have some effect on their vote. In fact, the, the polling on this has shown that around 63% of people are supporting a yes vote, but there may be quite a strong group of people who simply aren't speaking out for fear of being seen as homophobic, who when it comes to the actual vote itself might be voting no. So it's still a close run thing and it's not a dead cert, as they would say, that this is going to be a yes vote. So that is seeming more likely now. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, countries around the world uh, have changed simply their constitution or changed the, the law in the country. Why a popular vote? What's the, what's the big difference here in terms of uh, Ireland uh, as a people, maybe as a country, and, and also in terms of the law? Well, as we said, Ireland is traditionally quite a conservative country, mm -hmm. and so this is perhaps a bigger change for them than it is for some. You've got to remember abortion is still illegal there, and divorce has only relatively recently been made legal. So this is a country which has a level of conservatism which is important to remember when we're thinking about these sorts of social progressive changes. Uh, also, as I said, it's seen...
as a bigger support for the law in case somebody tries to challenge it later on if it's had this popular referendum. And finally, Ireland is no stranger to referendums. Uh, having had one to ratify the Maastricht Treaty, which was required for all European countries, in fact, it lost that one and simply held another one, making it uh, harder to lose the next time. So even if this vote were lost, that ne isn't necessarily the end of the road for the marriage equality campaign. And what does this mean for Northern Ireland? Is this vote, a vote uh, uh, also uh, credible for Northern Ireland, or does it only hold for the Republic of Ireland? No, this vote's for the Republic of Ireland. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the United Kingdom, gay marriage is in fact already legal uh, since 2014, and before that, civil unions in the United Kingdom. Uh, so it's quite a different thing. What is the media uh, coverage ha has been also in the UK, also within Ireland about this? Has this been gaining a lot of media coverage? Mostly in international news, and I'll say it from our point here in Tel Aviv, it's been more about, you know, Ireland being the first country to go to a referendum on this issue. That's right. Um, it, it has had a lot of coverage, and because it's quite a popular idea with young people, the media has also got behind that. Most politicians have got behind a yes vote. Celebrities have got behind a yes vote. Uh, and there has been a no campaign and some notable figures there, particularly from the church. But young people in the media have really pushed this through with lots of campaigning in order to get a yes, in order to allow same-sex couples to get married. And that's really been the level of attention it's getting. And it's really emphasizing the idea that Ireland is is really progressing in leaps and bounds from the traditional mm -hmm. image it's had in many ways, this being just one of them, into becoming a much more progressive country and a country where people are able to live more freely in a liberal way uh, in, in terms of being able to marry their partner of choice, whether it's somebody of the same sex or the opposite sex. This will be an enormous opportunity for that country to move forwards uh, in that respect as well. And Jonathan, some uh, last-minute logistics. Tonight is a vote. When will we be getting results, and when will this uh, vote be implemented? Should it be a yes? So we're expecting the results on Saturday somewhere during the day, around midday. And then from there on, the government will move quickly to put this into place as law so that gay people can start to get married within Ireland, uh, unlike, as you saw there, Colin Farrell, the actor right. speaking about his brother who had to go to Canada for that. Jonathan Satcherdati, our I-24 News European correspondent, speaking to us from London. Thank you for joining us. And we now say hello and good morning to Ami Kaufman, who joined us daily to discuss the news we've missed while scanning the headlines, or the ones deemed worthy to print. Mm -hmm. Ami, good morning. Good morning, Ilharia. I'm good. I see the bow tie is in full it's force. It's here every day. Okay. It's here well, every day. I'm not here every day, so I get to see it uh, once a week. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sticking with it. Good. Um, we're going back to the Middle East. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about this French uh, UN resolution that is probably going to happen. We don't know exactly when. But Le Figaro uh, reported yesterday, uh, the French paper, that uh, uh, France will impose an 18 month deadline for the completion of talks leading to the creation of a Palestinian state. And there, it's also been warning that uh, if a state is not created after that deadline, France will uh, 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 recognize Palestine uh, by itself without waiting for Israel or anything to happen. And this is, of course, uh, because of Federica Mogherini's visit It's on the heels the of region. her visit, Federica Mogherini's visit. And by the way, um, uh, we're seeing some more uh, European pressure uh, from uh, uh, the Norwegian foreign minister who was uh, here on uh, Wednesday, and he warned that a fresh wave of international pressure over the issues will uh, towards a two-state solution uh, once the Iran, Iran deadline uh, is passing on June 30th, uh, for, you know, when that agreement uh, is supposed yeah. to uh, culminate. When, when, they get, when they're finished with that uh, crisis, they'll move yeah. back uh, to the crisis. Everybody so in Europe is saying... in the Middle East, though, is a long time. That's a very long time, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Lots can happen until uh, <laughs> in 18 months. All right. Um, the White House and the, and, and, and the U.S. released um, um, some papers about uh, what was caught uh, at bin Laden's hideout when he was uh, killed in uh, Atot, Ab Abbottabad, Pakistan in 2011. And there's some interesting things yeah. that were uh, caught his, uh, on his bookshelf. First of all, there were works by Noam Chomsky and Bob Woodward. Wow. And there were some also interesting books about conspiracy theories concerning 9-11. Wow. Yeah. Um, there was also some stuff about how Al-Qaeda recruits its members with, you know, with questionnaires asking would-be jihadists, what objectives would you like to accomplish on your jihad path? Um, yeah, and just the fact that they had uh, this book called The War on Terrorism, and on Terrorism which is a conspiracy uh, book uh, that says uh, that 9-11 uh, uh, was a U.S. government conspiracy designed to trigger the Iraq war, and it claims that bin Laden's Al-Qaeda network is what the CIA calls an intelligence asset. 
And this comes on the heels of Seymour Hersh's, the journal, the American right. journalist Seymour Hersh's. Uh, we just published a really huge uh, article, uh, that article that the New Yorker wouldn't take. That's his uh, main home usually, but the, he, they wouldn't take it. They didn't believe it, and, and it yeah. basically says that the United States knew all along where Bin Laden was hiding. And right. there, Conspiracy More conspiracy. conspiracy. Yeah, a lot of people had a lot of critique about that Seymour yeah. Hersh interview, and it's interesting that the New Yorker didn't take it. Well, this is uh, probably the U.S. administration's response, saying, exactly. well, this, this is what was there. So. This is what, exactly. Um, and now off to uh, Cuba. Uh, uh, America and Cuba are getting really, really close to uh, uh, full diplomatic uh, relations. Um, it might, we might even hear today some news that they've uh, reached a deal. Uh, there are just some last uh, issues uh, uh, before they t uh, turn these uh, inter interest sections into uh, full-fledged embassies, which is what they have until now, interest sections. Um, it's been taking about five months for this whole thing to, pro to, to, to happen, a, a bit longer than what people expected. Mm -hmm. They can't agree on everything. They even can't agree on how many times they've met. This is <laughs> apparently the fourth round of talks, but by Cuba, by Cuba's count, it's only the third round of talks. So even on these little things, they can't agree. So and you're that, wondering. And that's what's stalling the opening of them. That's what's stalling the opening of them. I mean, <laughs> if diplomacy was that uh, easy, I think everyone would be doing <laughs> Totally. Round of talks. Well, soon we'll see uh, direct flights and so forth to Cuba. Direct flights and ferries that are going to go and uh, tour Tourism is going to be much yeah. Uh, bigger. Yeah, it's going so. to be. Cuba is really going to change immensely. And on that set, set uh, Obama can say that he was successful in foreign policy. Totally. And speaking of foreign policy, um, Hillary Clinton's private emails are going to be published by the State Department over the next few days. Um, you know, uh, these are emails that she used uh, her private email address to conduct her government work as Secretary of State, and uh, there were a lot, a lot of uh, a lot of pressure from the Republicans to uh, expose this. And she, of course, had no problem. She wants them out as well. And we're hearing now that um, uh, uh, the New York Times got about 1,850 pages of her emails, and they appear Anything to back juicy? up. Not well. Not really. They, they appear to back up her uh, assertions that she didn't receive any classified information at her uh, email address. But there were some uh, interactions between um, people in her office that were kind of interesting. For example, in March 2011, she got an email from Anne Marie Slaughter, who is the, the direct, who was the director of uh, policy planning for the State Department, and uh, her email said, "Gorgeous pic on the front page of the New York <laughs> Times," referring to a photo that she had, and she said, the "One for the wall." Nice. So there's a nice, uh, you know. Well, the, uh, anything that uh, is, uh, I guess, celebratory is not that bad. But she's running for president, and she's running for president. It's coming at a kind be, of you know, tricky time. A tricky time, and those emails might have something, you yeah. know. That which is why I think she's pushing to to get them out now as soon right. as possible, so that storm F will be behind her already, yeah. and move on to the next. Uh, but the next I, issue. I, with my uh, small knowledge of American politics, the Republicans will find anything in those emails to. Blast totally, over they're, they're yeah. totally latched onto anything that has to do with Benghazi and the attack in Benghazi, right. which uh, brought to death. No, the, but even uh, personal stuff. Totally, like gorgeous pick. <laughs> exactly. Could, she could have said, you know, that pick is not. <laughs> you're right. You're right. A study came out yesterday that it's not uh, very hot weather or it's not very cold weather that kills people. It is moderately, just moderately, cold weather that kills most people around the world. In fact, it kills uh, 20 times as many people as hot weather. Wow. The moderately cold weather. What? Because of uh, diseases that are, are, are because of yeah, just just exposure to, to to yeah, exactly diseases like that. Um, the researchers say that there's, they studied 74 million deaths in 384 locations between 1985 and 2012 across the UK and the US, and they found that while 7.7% uh, of all deaths were caused by temperatures that were too low or too high, cold was responsible for the vast majority. And well, moderate cold is mod is like perpetual coldness all year round. Exactly. Ah, oh, aren't we? Aren't you so, glad you're here? I know this Look is the best outside. place to be here, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we have extreme heat, so. <laughs> yeah, but our winters are kind of moderately cold. They're right. not like really. So I'm wondering, maybe it's not a great place to be. Well, I don't know. depends who you're asking. Our friends from Canada will say it's a joke. It's their summer. It's their <laughs> yeah. And lastly, but not leastly, um, China is going to open the largest Disney store in the world. Uh, I think we have some pictures there. It'll be 53,000 feet. It's massive. Uh, it's the first Disney store in China, um, and uh, it'll be the, 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 three, the 340th Disney store in the world. And I guess this is about pretty much happening ahead of um, their opening a Disneyland theme park wow. in the spring of 2016 uh, at the price of 5.5 billion dollars. Wow! So the Chinese so the are West getting. Has come the West, even further into yeah, China. Yeah, everybody's buying Mickey Mouse dolls and Donald Duck dolls. And they're probably and manufactured in China, right? And then yeah, yeah I, I guess they're cheaper there too, right? I mean, <laughs> one, one would think. One would think.
Yeah. Ami Kaufman, thank you for joining us. You know what was uh, the highlight of many people's uh, week uh, this week was uh, David Letterman's uh, last night uh, show. It was his last night show on, on Wednesday. Did you watch it? I didn't watch it, but I've been seeing some clips on uh, YouTube. And uh, it looks like it was pretty funny, and it was pretty emotional. Yeah, for people a lot of people. are mourning it. I mean, him yeah. and then John Stewart is going to be a tough time for late sh late night. It's going to be and, love. Uh, some he Do we have a short report about it? Let's take a look. Thirty-three years and over six thousand shows after he made his debut, the king of American late-night television, David Letterman, broadcast his last show Wednesday with guests from Hollywood stars to U.S. presidents paying final tribute. Our long national nightmare is over. Our long national nightmare is over. Letterman is retiring. The sarcastic, often grumpy 68-year-old comedy giant was the longest-serving nighttime talk show host and had inspired over the years a generation of comedians, many of whom bid farewell in their version of Letterman's famous nightly top ten list. Dave, I have no idea what I'll do when you go off the air. You know, I just thought of something. I'll be fine. <laughs> Outside the late-night studio doors in the Ed Sullivan Theatre in Manhattan's Times Square, fans crowded, and the lucky ones who made it to the inside audience described the feeling of witnessing history in the making. A lot of fun. There were a ton of standing ovations. Everybody was excited, obviously, to be there. You won the lottery to get in. Being at the final one was really important. The once-in-a-lifetime say goodbye to an idol and say, try to express gratitude. Critics have praised Letterman for combining innovative comedy with traditional interviews, despite losing viewers to his younger rivals. As he opened his final show, he addressed the biggest disappointment of his career. I'll be honest with you, it's beginning to look like I'm not going to get the Tonight Show. I don't think so. But Letterman was always considered extraordinary in the talk show landscape, especially standing out as the first comedian to go back on air after the September 11, 2001 attacks on the United States. For his swan song, Letterman, who started in television as a weatherman in his native Indianapolis, dropped his edginess and instead thanked his staff, his audience and his family. Letterman will be replaced by comedian Stephen Colbert. Described as the North Star for almost every comic who followed him, David Letterman had signed off for the last time. Signed off as uh, not weatherman anymore. That's a good not fun fact anymore. about yeah, David Letterman. Yeah, TV is morning. See, this, we, uh, we have we have our chances to make it big. I know, you and I, know. I. totally. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to see Stephen Colbert how he's going to fill these uh, these uh, big shoes. But I think he can really. Is he going to still be in character as uh, Stephen? No, I think he's going to finally get out of character. Really? Finally. I love that character though. He is great. I'm also wondering what's going to happen with Paul Schaefer, his sidekick. Right. For what's he going to do? I'm not I mean, sure. the whole band has to go now, right? Well, I'm not sure. Or do they keep maybe Stephen? Paul Schaefer? Will... I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know if they're going to keep him. <laughs> we'll invite Paul Schaefer here. <laughs> Ami Kaplan, you'll be back uh, with uh, Web Review in I just will. a second. I'm going to be here soon, uh, just after the break, with some of your morning headlines. We'll be right back. Welcome back to I-24 News Morning Edition. We're now here with I-24 News diplomatic correspondent Tal Shalev. Good morning, Tal. Good morning, Gail. And uh, Ami Kaufman is back here. Good morning, Ami. Good morning, Thank Gail. Thank you for staying with us. We're going to be beginning with uh, the wide-ranging interview with The Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg, which was published yesterday in the United States. The U.S. President Barack Obama addressed the tensions between the White House and Jerusalem, saying he was obligated to criticize Israel and its leaders when necessary, as it lends him credibility when defending the Jewish state in international arenas. The president also spoke out against a rising wave of anti-Semitism, but warned against equating it with criticism of Israeli policy. So, Tal, this is, uh, some will say, in Israel, the final nail in the, the relationship between Israel and uh, Jerusalem. Others will say it's not a big deal. He wasn't really criticizing. Well, he was criticizing, uh, but he wasn't sending a message to Jerusalem, but rather his messages um, intended inwards to the domestic uh, arena, to the Jewish community. Obama, it's a very sincere, very blunt, very emotional interview. It's not directed to the Israeli government. It's directed to the liberal Jews, to the home base. That's their language. And uh, this is Obama's favorite journalist writing in his favorite magazine, um, in a very prestigious magazine. Uh, um, and the message is to advocate the administration's policies, to try and explain the administration's policies. And he's playing on the shared values. So.
he's playing on uh, something we've been discussing quite uh, uh, lengthily, the growing rift between the liberal Americans, mm -hmm. the uh, young generation of uh, American jury from Israel shared values. And he doesn't mention it by name, but uh, the fact that this week there was this whole controversy uh, um, surrounding the West Bank uh, bus separation that definitely created uh, um, that definitely created a background for this uh, a very good background for this interview in which Obama talks a lot about the shared values. Any uh, comment uh, from <coughs> Jerusalem? Of course, uh, the prime minister met with the head of the Arab Joint List yesterday and, and set out a good uh, press release on his behalf. Does uh, Jerusalem have any comment over well, the Obama statement? Well, not from the, the prime minister's office, but we are hearing Likud politicians blaming Obama that he's disconnected from reality and accusing Obama. This is, of course, another step in the rhetoric. But, you know, at, at some point, this uh, dialogue between Obama and Netanyahu, it gets, even for, for journalists, it gets a bit, a bit boring. Uh, <laughs> once in a while, Obama gives a very wide-scale interview in which he criticizes Netanyahu, and he's trying to appeal to his home base. It's very clear. It's all in the wake also of the Iran deal. Right. Uh, Obama is trying um, to uh, hug the Jewish community to try and assure them on the Iran deal. And uh, this is part of a, a general outreach to the Jewish community, uh, which will actually this evening, Obama will be speaking at a Washington synagogue. This is also part of this general outreach. So uh, uh, this is the language that Obama is speaking to his own people. And it, right. it is also part of the preparations for 2016. The, Democrat, the Democrats need to keep their home base. They're afraid that some, uh, uh, that some Jewish votes might drift to the Republican Party. And, they, and Obama talks a lot about the, about the uh, voices in Washington that are making, uh, um, that are making in, the alliance be, uh, the being pro-Israel have to mean being pro-Israeli policy right, and, and pro Obama Netanyahu. wants to explain why that isn't the case in his point from his point of view and you spoke to another uh, leader from uh, the Democratic Party for some of his career throughout his 24 years in US Congress the former Connecticut senator Joseph Lieberman worked hard to maintain the good relations between Washington and Jerusalem the veteran Democratic lawmaker who famously endorsed Republican John McCain over Obama in the 2008 U.S. elections and then later became an independent was in Israel this week to receive the Guardian of Zion Award from Bar Ilan University. Had a few other uh, recipients, former recipients were Elie Wiesel, for an example. I-24 News diplomatic correspondent Tal, you sat down with Lieberman this week. Let's take a look at your report. Senator Lieberman, thank you for speaking with us. Pleasure. You arrive here uh, just a week after the new uh, Israeli government has been sworn in, and many in the, the world and in the United States have expressed concerns from the makeup and ideology of Netanyahu's new government. Are you concerned? Well, in the end, am I concerned about the makeup of the new government? You know, it's not my business. What I am concerned about is uh, making sure that U.S.-Israel relations not only stay where they are, but frankly get better. And. Um, Part of that is the commitment that Prime Minister Netanyahu has made to a two-state solution. Uh, and more generally, uh, the importance, in my opinion, of Israel being on the initiative in regard to uh, the peace process with the Palestinians. Uh, I know how difficult, re realistically, it is today uh, to achieve a peace with the Palestinians for various reasons. But no one should ever be able to say of an Israeli government that they, not, they have not been trying hard to achieve a just peace. But we do see a process of Israel losing support amongst various uh, sectors and publics in the United States, if we're talking about the Democratic Party, if we're talking about minorities, if we're talking about the young generation, or even American jury itself. Um, many of them complain that there's a contradiction between their support of Israel and their liberalism. How do you settle that contradiction? So um, things are not as bad for Israel in the U.S. as some people think. I mean, in terms of the relationship between uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Obama, uh, it, there's obviously been tensions between them. But I think uh, the reality is much better than uh, the media portrays or, or politicians uh, portray. Now, I don't, I don't sit back uh, on, 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 a, on the comfortable chair and say everything is beautiful in the U.S. for Israel, because there are increasing, pla increasing uh, uh, concerns about places, some within the left of the Democratic Party, um, some on college campuses where people are not now reflexively pro-Israel. And I think one of the things that we have to do, and I speak of this as a Democrat, 
is that um, we have to remind people in America who raise these questions about Israel that Israel is by far the most liberal society, country in the Middle East. It's a country of the rule of law. It's a country that recognizes um, human rights, diversity of, of population, free expression. There's a lot of aggressive politics here in Israel, but no government locks up uh, its opponents the way it happens in other countries around the world. Yeah, you were one of the staunchest supporters of uh, Netanyahu's Congress speech, uh, but uh, eventually, when we look back, how much impact do you think it really had? Did it not have any counter effect by creating a sort of partisan divide on Israel and Iran? I thought the speech itself was compelling and uh, actually helped to build opposition uh, to the negotiations that are going on now if they don't get better with Iran about their nuclear program. I also, I mean, everything in Washington today is partisan. So the reaction to Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech was partisan. But take a look at the vote in Congress a couple of weeks ago, and that vote was overwhelmingly bipartisan and overwhelmingly uh, positive. And I think that some of the arguments of Prime Minister Netanyahu made to Congress helped to build that ultimate consensus. Frankly, I, I, I wish that President Obama would do with Prime Minister Netanyahu what he just did with the leaders of the Gulf Cooperation Council and invite Prime Minister Netanyahu to Camp David to just sit together and hash out some of the differences between them. Uh, that's the only way to get it to a better place. And then to talk about specific actions that both of them can take to build more confidence uh, in the other. Because um, the U.S. and Israel need each other. I mean, Israel needs the U.S. more than the U.S. needs Israel. But uh, in a Middle East that is now as unstable as it is, Israel remains the only ally which the U.S. knows will be with us in a time of conflict or crisis. And um, we don't want to jeopardize that. How much do you think uh, the Obama administration shares or bears responsibility for the current situation in the Middle East? Um, the Obama administration didn't create uh, Islamist extremism and terrorism. Uh, but there's no question that the position that the Obama administration has taken since it came into office, that, as the president puts it, he wanted to get America out of wars, not get America into wars, has resulted in a perception that America is pulling back. And when, when America pulls back, uh, America's enemies jump in. And that's uh, what has happened here in, in the Middle East. The extremists uh, now expressing themselves through the Islamic State are on the move. Iran is on the move. I mean, it's now playing a dominant role in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Yemen, and some role uh, in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're good, we're the forces of good uh, are not strong and aggressive. The forces of evil will fill the vacuum. And I fear that that is what has happened here in the Middle East. So looking ahead uh, to the 2016 uh, presidential race, how much do you think uh, Israel will become a campaign issue? Um, it's a good question. And uh, my guess is that uh, the Republican candidate, whoever you, that Chris. is, will want to make Israel an issue in the election, which is to say to criticize the Obama administration for not having given adequate support to Israel. It, it will then be a challenge to the Democratic nominee, who I presume will be Secretary Clinton, to uh, rebut that and to do it in, her, in personal terms. In other words, if she's running in her own right, not as the candidate of the Obama uh, administration. And um, so I think in the end, uh, the choice will be between two uh, actively pro-Israel candidates, one Republican and one Democratic. And this is just a long shot. Have you uh, decided who you're going to support? Uh, no, I haven't. I'm enjoying just being able to sit back and watch it happen for a while. But knowing myself, sometime next year I'll get involved. Senator Lieberman, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you, Tal. 
So Tal, among uh, the much, uh, much things that he did say, he also has a very clear message for Netanyahu. Well, first of all, he's very in intent on uh, showing that the situation isn't as bad as we think. And he says the, it says it, he says the message with sweet words and with a lot of Netanyahu's talking points. But at the end of the day, he does say that uh, um, if Netanyahu wants to keep the U.S. relationship good, he has to recommit to, to the two-state solution. He has to take initiative on the liberal process and go back to the affirmative over the liberal of the country, and that is something that we hear also in Obama's interview, but in much uh, harsher words. On the other hand, he also has a message to uh, uh, the president himself when he says he wishes that Obama would just invite Netanyahu over like he did with the leaders of the GCC at Camp David, at, uh, at Camp mm -hmm. David and just talk over the differences. So he says it with very nice words and uh, with, a, with a large smile, but Lieberman definitely thinks that there, uh, sh there is something that can be done in this relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always easier when you're out of the political race, isn't it? You can say whatever you your heart desires. Tal Shalev, thank you for joining us. Stay with us. Ami's here for some uh, web uh, viral spiral viral web. Spiral. Yeah, well, this one isn't exactly, the first item isn't exactly viral spiral, but I'm sure that uh, you and Tal were really, were really worried about this last night, okay. but Israel got through to the finals of the Eurovision last night for the first time in five years. Can I tell you that I'm still singing that song? Let's take a look. <laughs> I don't think we have a, oh. a song of that. We, I could sing it for you, but yeah. it wouldn't really sound that. No, no, I, know, I, it, not, no I just heard <laughs> it once, and it's Golden already, Boy Golden by Boy. Nadav Gage. Right, and he's a young 16-year-old guy. He's 16 years old, and he's yeah. amazing, actually. He's really good. He's good, and I heard it once, and I already know the entire song. You do? Which is, which is a good... It's a that's good, a good thing for that's the Eurovision. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. Yeah, that's a very good singer. <laughs> I know that, actually. I've heard this from other people. Not well, <laughs> oh, stop it, you two. What else do you have? Um, you know how Delta has these funny safety videos every once in a while they put on their planes? I, I really like flying Delta just because of that. They have a new one out, which is uh, where they use uh, memes. They use 25, the most popular memes. Oh, and I no. think we have a few seconds that Let's we can watch yeah. of this. For everyone's safety, federal regulations require all passengers to comply with the posted placards and lighted information signs located throughout the cabin, in addition to any crew member instructions. Smoking, including the use of e-cigarettes, is not allowed on any Delta flight. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that Harlem Shake. Wow. Yeah, you should watch the whole thing. It's like three and a half minutes, or no, I think it's actually six minutes, and right. it's full of really funny. Memes. That's a reason it's to really, fly uh, that company, really but we won't endorse yeah. it. Quickly. Quickly, uh, Scrabble. Ha there's a new official uh, Scrabble dictionary. You know, when you say that's not a word. Yeah. Well, they're okay. Oh. So they have some new words and a lot of slang and technology stuff like lols <laughs> and <laughs> bezzy and ridic, which Ridic. is of course ridiculous, and technology stuff like, like omg. I, I think it's already might be there. Yeah. But uh, FaceTime. Hacktivist, nice. hashtag sexting. Sexting. And some Let's other see. stuff like yeah. blech and ew wow. and grr, which is G R R. So is this for sale, this book? I mean, this Of course, is... if you're a, a, you know, an avid player, then you I, have to get the, yeah. the latest edition of the Collins official Scrabble book. I love book. Scrabble. And the, the, nobody will be able to say, you know, we that's not a word anymore. Time for one more headline? Well, we can show a, a video of my favorite dog in the world. Do we have okay. time to show this let's, video of my favorite dog in the world? Let's take a look at the video. Yeah, your favorite dog in the world. That dog knows what's good he for knows him. He knows what he, I, I wonder if he takes himself out, too. Why is that every, your favorite dog in the world? Because he looks just like really smart. Really, I, really smart. Uh, he I wanted love smart to tan dogs. in the sun. He just took his bed over to tan. I mean, would you, you know. believe how viral that video is? It's all over the place. She's not an animal person. That's, I, it's, that's it's hard not to hurt true. I actually <laughs> am an animal person. <laughs> <laughs> Ami Kaufman, uh, thank you for joining us, Tal. Thank you for joining us. Coming up next, we're going to have the best of the morning edition, an interview with Iska Smith, a former Orthodox rabbi who now identifies as a woman in everything you need to know about Eurovision 2015 song contest. We heard a little bit, but first, let's hear more of this morning's headlines. Have a great weekend.